G'day and welcome to Mark and Sam After Work. Today I want to go through a video on a topic I get asked quite a bit, um, but that is um, how to select the best ELR bullet. So the best bullet for extreme long range shooting. Um, and I suppose it's a, there's a, a couple of different angles that I would take at that. Um, and listen, I'll get into a bit more of my, my opinions on the whole subject a little bit later in the video, but to start off with the ways to get to, to make this decision. Um, and that is basically for those people who are not aware of what you're talking about there, largely in, in, a, in a long range, an extreme long range projectile. You want, a, you want one that has very good, uh, a, a good ballistic coefficient, um, that is nice and consistent, that is going to travel well to target to give you the least bullet drop so you get to target the easiest, carrying the most energy out to target um, and dealing with the wind and various environmental conditions the best. So get there in the best form. Which the external ballistics of, of the projectile um, are a key feature, but they're not everything. There's also the weight of the projectile and how much energy you've got in your, the amount of powder in your cartridge to get that projectile going to the right sort of speed. And what I'm actually talking about there is there's a trade-off in a higher ballistic coefficient bullet, which will be a longer and almost always heavier projectile. Um, the trade-off is that it's heavier, which means it's not got for the same amount or the same amount of potential powder that you can run or that your cartridge um, capacity and its efficiency is how fast you're going to be able to get that projectile going. The faster you get it going, the faster it's going to get to target, the less time it spends in the air. Equally, the more efficient it is, the more, the more efficient shape of the projectile and design of the projectile, the less it slows down, the faster it'll get to target um, and the less time it'll spend in the air. So those two things seem to work in the same direction, so more of everything is better, isn't it? Well, no. What happens is that the, the longer and heavier that projectile is, the less speed it can actually get. So you've got to try and find this balance between it's not just the highest VC and whatever format is going to be the best result for you. You're going to find a balance in there somewhere. So that's what that question really comes into. At what point, how do I figure out that balance? How do I figure out how much VC? Let's, let's use a couple of cases in point. We'll go with a 30 cal. You may be talking about a 308 and what that projectile that can run um, and a 300 um, Norma, 300 Norma Magnum. Um, one cartridge is reasonably close to double what the other cartridge is. The 308 you're far more likely to find running in the 175, 180 grain projectile um, and the 300 Norma you're far more likely to running around the 230 grain projectile. Those are sort of averages of what you're going to find. But how do people get to that selection when you're trying to figure it out for yourself and what's best? Would it be better to run the 308 at the 245 grain projectile? It's a very high bullet. Can it still do it? It's a very high ballistic coefficient bullet. Can it still do it? The truth is no, it's conceivable, but no, it doesn't actually get to being a better thing. And there is a trade-off where, where the potential speed you can get out of the bullet doesn't use the efficiency of the, the efficiencies of that bullet, doesn't get to use that that um, ballistic coefficient. And then there's another feature to keep in mind when it comes to accuracy and consistency, how your cartridge works that powder, how efficient it is in trying to push the, the heavier or lighter bullet. Also, the amount of recoil that when you've got a heavier projectile, there is more recoil going on. So it can be to the weight of the rifle, to the way the shooter is, to the, then, the, then the subtle nuances of um, barrel vibrations and harmonics and that sort of stuff can come into it. I don't tend to go down that road, but these are all relevant details. So that is a more complicated explanation of the simple bit we're talking about. The ways to get there, I feel there are, there's two, major, two main ways to get to this place. One is in the full data, process. So you can get programs like Quickload, which for those don't realize it's a UK based um, software. You can buy it all over the world. You look up on their web store, you'll find that. And that can go through and you can put in the details of what your projectile is in that program. They already have 
I don't know, the 1200 projectiles or something like that, lots of different cartridges and projectiles, things like that. You can put in your details and put in your finer details as well. You can go through with all sorts of things from setting depth to, to your throat length to all sorts of stuff. You can go in and do that sort of things. But you put in your basics of that sort of stuff. You go through and put in the powder you've got. They'll generally have the powder you've got. But you put in the powder you've got and then put in a specific load. Go down to the bottom here and work out where you're going to running in the pink zone sort of stuff where you're basically going up into the top of your pressure but you're not not too little not too much in a place where it should be okay now keep in mind this is just a should be thing there are nuances beyond that point when you actually go to load but in the way of designing and figuring this out without just going and testing you can put in there and then you can get a speed from that of what you're really likely to be able to produce out of that round in your rifle with the sort of powder, do, do, do the playing around, doing the bits and pieces, swap things around, move it around, and use their database, essentially. There's algorithms and database involved in this sort of software that are gonna give you an idea of what sort of speed you can expect to see in your combination. Then you go through and run in any of the ballistic calculators and see how much bullet drop it takes to shoot the distance you're trying to shoot. Now it is relevant, it isn't just go and set yourself a airy fairy benchmark of two miles and that's where you're going regardless. It really is what you're going to shoot at, whether that's a thousand metres or that's 1500 metres or that's a mile or that's um, 2000 or 3000 or two miles or three miles, it doesn't really matter. You're putting in that equation and then seeing what bullet drop you've got. Then change your, change your, your projectile. So then you can look at, and I've got a range of bullets in front of me, this, the, which have, there is yings and yangs that go with them. You'll tend to me, largely the reason why there's more burger here is, is burgers in front is because I use more of them. This is just some of what I have played with, do use, test, all sorts of stuff. Um, and there isn't one um, brand is, is um, phenomenally different or better than other there's all sorts of bits and pieces you'll tend to find in the simple in the simple place of bullets is that the, the it is a little bit money for value you do tend to um, if you spend more you tend to be getting more not always not completely but generally if it's more expensive it's because it took it cost a little bit more to build there's a little bit more consistency there's a little better design there's those bits and pieces but what I'm really trying to say with it is there's nothing right and nothing wrong, but you should be able to get the projectile you're looking for and get the data off it. Do the Google, do the manufacturer's um, catalog, do whatever it is and get your ballistic coefficient with your bullet weight and then do some comparisons. And that is your first bit about your efficiencies of your bullet. That's the way that, like I said, that's analytical. You've got all your software, you've got your bits and pieces, you want to figure it all out and you go through that process and then match it all up to get to where you've probably got two or three bullets that are going to be very similar. But that'll give you an idea. Keep in mind that is just an idea, but that will give you an idea. The next thing to do, or the place where I more likely start, is to do a bit of research. There's, there's, I suppose there's a little bit I would say that... Um, when you do it enough, there's a sort of an intuition, there's a bit of a, oh, listen, this is the sort of weight that I think I'm going to run, and where's the intuition come from in that sort of level? Really, it's just reading, it's, um, it's whether that's forums or that's um, manuals or that's um, keeping you to the ground in all sorts of forms, getting an idea of things. It obviously helps when you've shot lots and lots of cartridges, but when you're shooting, when you've got your, whatever it is, your new 300 PRC, or you've got your old 300 win mag, or you've got a 30, whatever it is, it doesn't, doesn't matter at all. <clears throat> if you start to pay attention to this sort of stuff, start to do a bit of Googling. What, what I will definitely do is go through on some of the search engines, whatever, whatever that is, uh, search engine, and look on some of the forums, and just read. Don't take any of the forums for, for granted. There are some, you know, I caught a fish that was this big, it just got away type thing. Um, there's a bit of that sort of stuff that's on there. So some of the speeds that people talk about are unattainable. Um, so don't take one piece of information as to real information. Um, I'm, I, what I'm really trying to say there is take it as, as a, um, with a pinch of salt and keep on reading read here and read there and read this sort of stuff and you'll tend to find that yes there's one place that says that 
this round with this load in this length produces this speed. There's another place that produces this speed. You'll tend to find the outliers just by doing enough reading and comparing. Um, and then that's, like I said, whether you got that from analytical data to start off with and then you're backing it up or you're just starting in this place, do the reading. It's the same place where I would tend to work out for the bits and pieces of whether it's the barrel length or it's the cartridge I'm looking for or it's the twist I'm going to run or all the bits and pieces to try and make sense of things in a general sense. I mentioned twist there. It's something I would, I would dot into. A lot of guys tend to be wanting to over twist nowadays. More, the, the more um, barrel twist is better. I've never been a person that goes there. I'll tend to be trying to run a little more speed and keep in mind that in, in whatever form I'm trying to do, whether I'm throating the, the, um, the, the projectile forward, so pushing the throat forward in the chamber so I can run it out a little bit so I can get the cartridge to run a little more efficiency with the top level of powder or whether um, the, the barrel length or whatever it is, I'm trying to, even the cartridge choice, I'm trying to run per the calibre, which is the bore size, I tend to be trying to run a little more speed and keep in mind when it comes to stability, which is talking about people do a direct correlation of stability versus barrel twist. There's a bit missing in that equation. Stability is, a, is the RPM of the bullet, the revs per minute of the bullet, how fast it's spinning. Twist doesn't generate that by itself. It's about speed. So if you have a 30 cal, we'll go back to our 308, if you have a 308 trying to run, let's say, a 230 gram projectile, it's probably only going to be producing around the 2300, 2400, if you're lucky, feet per second out of that projectile, probably less, probably 2100 feet per second or 2000 feet per second. So that's all it's going to be producing. So that in a 1 in 10 twist is not going to stabilize a 230 gram projectile. Whereas a 300 wind mag, although it's closer to it, although it's not um, at high stability, in my experience, a 300 wind mag, even in just a 26 inch barrel running decent speed, stabilizes the 230 gram projectile without any problems. And then you go to the proper equation and it'll tell you that really you should be running a one in nine or a one in eight and a half because of in, in what they would recommend is optimum twist. But optimum twist is always relevant to the fact that they're, you're, they're trying to generalize the cartridge that's going into. So speed is a big factor. I tend to run a little bit slower, but always keep it in mind. If you've got a 3378 Weatherby Magnum, you probably can pull off a 250 gram projectile at a one in 10, maybe, yeah, a one in 11 twist is simply because it's only running 3,300 feet per second. So. There's a little bit of intuition involved with that. Yes, you can go with the simple, go with the, the manufacturers and optimum twist, look at that side of things, but try and factor in a little bit of the speed you're running at, because that's actually what we're talking about. And the other place to do that, like I said, is the forums. Just go through and see what people are running and make sense of it. And I suppose that's, um, with those two things, you put that together, there's also at your local club, at the, at the gun store, not so much, but a little bit. Um, in the competitions, that type of thing, seeing what other people are running, see what other people are doing. I would put into a little caveat to go with that is competitions are for competitions. It's a little bit different than, than I suppose what I would see as the, as the um, more normal um, ELR people, guys. Um, and competitions do tend to follow the leader. So, which isn't always the only path, I suppose I would say. Nothing wrong with that, but it isn't the only path. There is a, there is a broader perspective actually, and sometimes actually the, and I suppose that's where I'd move into the, the rest of this conversation. But in my way of looking at ELR, it is, it is about um, development of the sport for sure, in the way of the development of shooting, pushing the boundaries with optic systems, with spotter calls, with reading wind, with, with the skill it takes to work out what's going on, um, the skill slash luck in slash patience of all the things it takes to create shots at and get on target at ridiculous distances. Those are all um, uh, personally um, building things. They, it's, a, it's a sense of achievement to do that side of things. But in my mind, the real ride and the real purpose of what we do um, is 
that involved in the way of becoming better at what you do. It teaches you to do things better. You know, if you can work out how to do things at 3,000 yards or at 2,000 yards, whatever it is extreme for you, if you can work out to do that and you come back into where you actually, whether you hunt or you in a local competition, that sort of stuff, you're shooting 600 yards or 300 yards or 200 yards or 100 yards or 800 yards or 1,000 yards or whatever it is, you come back down to those distances and you'll find those skills. Your skills are greatly enhanced by your abilities or by your learning that you've done at extreme long range in the ELR. The bigger detail I would say is it is about uh, learning by trying, learning by testing. A general idea is all I use to try and select a projectile and I'll go out and try and make that work. And a couple of Beautiful. bits that go with that. One is um, to find the absolute best projectile um, it doesn't make you the absolute best shooter, it doesn't make your rifle the absolute best thing by any means. There's only small differences. Yes, there are projectiles that are terrible um, and the, yes, there are ones that are way too big or way too small. So a general idea, yes, you can get there. Um, and I suppose what I'm trying to say there is you can go out with, with a projectile that's too heavy. I've been there and done the 220 grain projectile in the 308. It still performs, it does things okay and that side of things. Was it actually better than shooting a very efficient 175 grain projectile in uh, up to um, 2,000 meters. No, it wasn't. It was. It was its own thing of doing. It was interesting to do and see how it performed. Um, and I suppose in vice versa, you you can be um, if you're the, the little dog in the big dog competition and you still do really well. That is worth more than being a big dog and doing okay. I suppose is a little bit of the strategy I'm trying to say there. The, the, the real detail about this, it is about, I suppose what I'd say when this comes to winning competitions or doing really well at what you're doing, it's the practice, it's the trigger time, it's the learning. And part of that, and, I, and to my honest belief in the, in the general sense of things, is the opposite to what some of the competition would tell you. Some of the competition would tell you to be good at what you do and to win your competition you have to practice with the thing you use and only with that so you learn it intimately and that side of things and they're right for what they're doing but for what general skill building is no that's a rabbit hole that is teaching you that thing and that thing only to some degree by being more general about things and by trying things that don't work quite so well but you work how to work with them um, and then make an adjustment, go to a different place, try these, see the differences, understand the differences. You are not only learning and developing a broader skill set in doing that side of things and learning more about it, you're also learning more information, more, learning more of the signs of what you're reading. If you're paying attention, you're obviously all the time getting more trigger time. You're working out how to use what you've got as well as you can, which is also, I suppose, something to keep in mind in, in current conditions with the particular power of the projector projectiles or whatever it is they're moving around. It's not so easy to find that, some, that sort of stuff and who knows what the future brings. So being able to be more flexible is a good thing. But even without that, even with, all, even with full abundance and everything there, to try some stuff and go down some roads and get a rough idea and try this and then move it a little bit and try this and then work out a development in between, I feel that's part of the ride. I think that's what, to me, ELR is about. Actually broadening your skill set, becoming better at what you do, being a little more flexible with things and then being able to bring that to the table with whether that is fine-tuned into where you've really figured out what suits your combination the absolute best, which whether it's quick load or it's a ballistic app or it's a training course or it's whatever, all of it will come down to you. You are the one, you and your combination have to work well to be, together and actually a little bit of R&D is involved, a little bit of research and development to get you and it and everything working to its best. Or it's a case of you're always moving the goalpost a little bit. You're always moving them. You try this, this worked pretty well. You tried this, this worked pretty well. You tried this, this worked a little better. You tried this, that worked a little worse, but still did pretty well with it. That sort of stuff is a little bit the nature of this thing. You're testing, you're trying, you're using things, you're learning, you're developing. It's fun. It's fun. Sometimes it's, it's just, it's more fun to achieve something that was really difficult with something that isn't perfect than it is to achieve it with something that was perfect and really sort of anyone could do it type thing. Anyway. 
not saying anyone can do it. A lot of this stuff is extremely hard. I'm my whole benefit and what I really bring to the table is the fact that I have lots of I have good conditions. Well, apart from wind, I have a good um, property area. It's not too far away for it's easy for me to go out and do this. And I have a reason to go out and do more shooting and test more stuff and things like that because I have this channel, because I have you, the audience, to go and have a look at what I do. So there's a drive to go and do that more and test more. That makes me better at what I do simply because I'm doing more of it, but it also is about that flexibility thing. It is also about trying different things, things that don't work so well, still needing to achieve, still need to make it work. I have the bad days as well. I have things that don't work. You don't get to see it because I don't want to show something that just never got close enough to matter. Um, those years largely are in the years gone by, but it is still part of trying to get to the better place. And now I would say, like I said, intuition. I suppose in this format, intuition is just simply lots of experience, but um, it's something you gain by lots of experience and not necessarily by simply getting an analytical answer and put it into the, uh, another program to put it into another thing to build this load to potentially go out and do this thing. And even if it works really well, I think you miss the best part of the ride and that's the figuring it out by yourself to some degree. Anyway, guys, um, I'm sure that there's some people who would tell you I'm barking up the wrong tree there. But um, yeah, like I said, my mind, I think that's the, that's the thing that is the really special about this um, habit, hobby, enthusiasm, whatever it is. Uh, but listen, anyway, that's enough of me yabbering. Um, thanks very much for checking in and we'll um, catch you next time.